roll call? There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Kendra Adams is absent. Rochelle Brodsky here. Ron Clark is absent. Frank Bassler here. Ron Dunworth here. Brian Lampy here. Lance Nichols. Scott Carpentier. Uh, Attorney Garcia here. And we have with the staff Bud Hunt, Casey Lanzinger Pierce, Katie Messerly. And Kling, and online we have Natalie Wagner taking minutes. And we have Aaron Mitchell, our bookkeeper. Okay. Uh, would anybody like to make any changes to the agenda? Yes, I would like to move up a new business item one presentation by the Library Friends and Foundation, Jenny Whittington and Joanne Perko, so that they don't have to stay for our entire board meeting if they don't choose to. Okay, um, at this point, I don't see where there's any public in person for input. Oh, oh, okay. Should we, um, would anybody like to make a motion to um, approve the agenda at, with a small change of moving up the Friends and Foundation presentation to probably right after public input? I'll move to accept the agenda with uh, Ann Kling's uh, adjustment. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion passes, and I guess we're on to public input. And as usual with our Zoom stuff, if anything pops up, we can always check the chat and be willing to accept any sort of public input. Um, should we uh, go ahead with the presentation from the uh, Friends and Foundation? Yes, I think that would be really good. Okay, welcome Jenny and Joanne. All right. So Bud is going to get up. Well, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jenny Whittington, and I am the current president of the Friends and Foundation. And we have been meeting to come to a board meeting or just get more involved with the board of trustees so that um, there's more information sharing and everyone knows you know, we're all pulling in the same direction <laughs> as far as library goals. So, um, you can, should I just tell you when we go to the next slide? Please. Yep, next slide, that's us. Um, so the foundation, the Friends and Foundation is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. And we, uh, we help the library. We, I describe it to people as kind of a booster club for the library. So we create um, events that raise money to help the library buy items or put on programming that fall outside of their usual budget. So um, we also do author talks and we go to town events to just spread information to the community about what's going on at the library. Next slide. So the history, I actually was digging through the box that Joyce Johnson gave me the other night when I became president. And we actually started in 2005. So it started at the, as the Windsor Sevens Library Foundation. <clears throat> and we, from my understanding, the main goal was to create an entity that the community could donate to the library through because there are policies or I, I'm not sure that there are laws that the library can't accept money from the community, but we can. And so we accept the, the money and we steward the money and then we you know, make gifts and grants to the library as they need it. Um, another goal from what I um, was reading through the history was to kind of start saving an endowment uh, nugget to invest so we could start making money on the money that we raise. Um, it looks to me like the maybe one of the major historical fundraising um, events that the foundation did was they helped with the bookmobile. And I don't know if Anne, do you remember? A, I found a letter for a letter writing campaign addressed to what would be a, you know, yeah. That was so before like, my time. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, so it, it was a letter saying, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, I'm Lily Beard and uh, I 
think they did help raise some funds for the bookmobile. And then the name changed, of course, to Clearview Library District Foundation. And then I believe in 2017, we added Friends. So it's now the Clearview Library District Friends and Foundation. Next slide. Okay, so right now, these are our financials. We, our total assets are running just over 100,000. And Debbie Lindahl did a great job of sending over what our total revenues and expenses over the past um, 12 years or 11 years have been. And so in 12 years, our net income has been 86,824. And most of that right now is in CDs. So there is opportunity for some investments. We just have not really set up. We don't have the expertise to do that right now. So Debbie, I think every time our checking account gets you know, another 10 or $20,000, she puts it in a new CD. So that's how we are managing our funds right now. Next slide. In 2019, we decided to create an MOU with the, with the library. And this is important because, um, you know, there are certain things that we depend on the library for, and there are certain things that the library depends on us for. And just so everyone's on the same page, it's nice to have it in writing. So we're not like, hey, I thought you were gonna do this um, and, and it doesn't get done and vice versa. So most of you, I don't, I know Rochelle was on the board, but I don't think anybody else was. So um, Anne is gonna post the MOU so you guys can all review it. And it talks about um, the library helps us with hosting our website. They help um, create space in the library for our promotional materials. Um, and it, it goes through it. I think um, Bill, you helped Ian with that, right? You helped draft that up, yep. So it's been approved and, but it's important to look at for our board and for your board so we can make changes if we need to and everyone knows what each other are doing. Next slide. So we have had a lot of fun with some outreach. We usually have a harvest festival booth at the park and we hand out foundation information and library information and hand out little goodies to the kids. We hand out candy at the Halloween parade, the downtown Halloween parade, which now is in, a, it's in Boardwalk Park. It used to be on, are those two different? The BBA one is still along the businesses up and down the street. And that's put on by the chamber, right? That yeah. one. And then the Historical Society puts on another one in the walking museum and we've done that one too. So we've done both of them. Um, we do severance days. We, a couple years ago, we set up tables at local businesses just with our sign and stop people as they came in to tell them about the library. We've dropped off library cards, you know, sign up for a library card information on doors. We have a fun event that we only got to do once, but we plan on doing again. We tell all of the friends to bring their unwanted books and then we drive around town and fill all the little libraries that are around Windsor and then meet for dinner afterwards. Um, a couple years ago we did yard signs that said a, a reading was here and we handed them out and kids could put them in their adults could put them in their yards. So it was just um, bringing what you guys do here at the library out into the community so that you're more visi visible you know in more ways. Next slide. We also did two camp, you know, the foundation was essential for the two ballot initiatives. They were really the primary funders for both ballot initiatives, which both failed. <laughs> but um, the foundation will be critical if you go for another one because they will have, you know, we'll have a friends network. We uh, would have the money to fund it because obviously the library can't come in and fund their own ballot initiative. Next slide. So for fundraising, we are really going to be looking at this hard in this fall because we typically have done the beer tents 
in the park and we got a three-year contract in 2017 which was great and it was a lot of fun we brought in forty six thousand dollars but it does take a lot of training and volunteers we have to get everyone tips trained and we have a calendar that everyone you know has to sign up for and we have to set up um but for three years forty six thousand dollars that was a pretty nice um fundraiser unfortunately the town did not award us with the 2021 contract so they gave it to the school foundation from what we understand for only one year so we have to decide whether we are going to go and apply for that contract next year so it was well i just this is from my um, and what was said to me was that, you know, for a while they didn't even know if they would have the concert because of COVID. So it was kind of a last minute decision. And, um, you know, it was, they just had to grab what they could and they were available. They did have the manpower where um, we wouldn't have had the manpower that quickly to get back in, in place. And so it was like, it's a one year thing. And then we'll start again with you know putting out for the contract next season. That's what we were saying. I don't want to steal your thunder, but I, I learned a little something being a liaison and coming to the meetings that um, the town was actually charging for takedown of the tent. And that's because there wasn't enough manpower through the Friends and Foundation mm -hmm. to do the whole start to finish kind of deal. So I don't know if that's what kind of um, stimulated them to go with the school board or if they had sympathy for the fact that the school board is going on the ballot and they wanted to kind of but going forward I think the friends and foundation is kind of thinking geez if we want to go for the beer tent again we kind of needs more troops here so that we can not be charged for that and do the whole thing and that's kind of where we come in too which I was going to kind of mention when I was doing my reports as a liaison um, we need to find a way to help boost the troops and to be more specific and letting them know what we're expecting or hoping for or how they can help just kind of trying to communicate where we're at in our future plans and how they can play a part that's hard for us to figure out right now but we got to have this in our mind that they're ready and want to help and... yeah absolutely next slide okay so here are some other fundraisers our membership dues which we started um, the membership in 2018, maybe the end of 2018. Yeah. So we've only been going for a couple of years. So that is not very much money and we hope to boost it in the coming years. We, yeah. We lost the, the storage capability of all those books um, because it took up a storage unit that was, what size, 10, 20, it was 12 by 20, it was a, and it was on um, the property over at Tozier. Well, they had to move that storage unit because those um, modulars were moved in. So they sold that storage unit, which eliminated our ability to store books. Okay, well, the other uh, other thing is there's not a good place in Windsor to do it. Um, we did use the rec center for many years. It used to be in this room until we outgrew this room. And then at that point, the rec center hadn't been remodeled. And so they were gracious enough to actually let us store the books up on the second floor and then have the book sale there. Um, and, and that worked until they did the remodel and put in the walking track and all the other good features at the rec center. And then after that, it was a struggle. We did it at the Methodist Church on, on Fifth Street and Walnut, and that wasn't perfect, but there weren't a lot of places where there would be the space and that would be easy for people to get in and out of, of the building where there weren't a lot of stairs to go up and down. Um, and so we did that, but actually, over time, what we discovered was that for all the work that went into the book sale, you made pennies. Um, it was hours and hours and hours of work. I think and those the last money for the years were really the um, 
the people who were coming weren't buying as much, not as many people were coming. So yeah, it didn't pay off as well in those final couple of years. It, it was at one time, because they would do two sales a year. They would do a spring sale and a fall sale. So it was about $6,000 a year. Um, compared to the Loveland book sale, which is at the ranch, they make $27,000 on a book sale. But they have a lot of storage space where they can keep things sorted ahead of time. They have a whole core of volunteers, and they get to use the ranch for their book sale. So... Uh, and they only do it for a weekend. Our book sale would be a full week. Uh, so it was a lot of people hours to do a full week because it would be almost a week of setup and a week of the book sale and then the takedown. Um, but the, the Loveland one, because it's been going for so long and because they have space is very profitable. Although they say theirs is starting to decline too because people just aren't buying as many books. Well, and just to add to your comment, the last time I spoke to somebody from um, the Loveland Library um, about their book sale, they were concerned that they were going to lose their storage space because the city had been allowing the library to use a very nice storage area, very large, obviously. And um, the city was talking about using that for something else. And if they would lose that, then they would have to pay for some place to rent and that would greatly impact their profit. So it's not just here. Other libraries have a struggle doing book sales too. We still have out in the hallway that bookshelf, and we do have a volunteer who goes through the library discards and any books. We don't take donations, but sometimes people just take them in a book drop. Um, and so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so she, the volunteer does go through and put the books out on that shelf and there's also dvds and blu-rays out there too and those we sell um, here in the library on a year-round basis all right next slide okay so gifts to the library in 2019, the foundation decided to sit down with the library and decide what they, what the library needed. So they came up with a list, and on that list was intergenerational programming, children's books, tech toys, and I feel really bad about this. Is your magazine called The Focus? But what is it called now? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I think the focus sounds right, but I couldn't remember. Um, so we had big plans in 2019, like couldn't wait to get this unrolled in 2020, um, especially the intergenerational programming. We interviewed some fun uh, programming people to come in and record grandparent stories and all of these fun things. And then the pandemic hit. So we really, that $10,000 we were going to give to the library um, really got shifted around from these things. So instead of children's books, we did take, we funded some holiday take home kits. And we did end up getting one of the intergenerational programs in fit in. So, um, Yeah, so we have um, plans to do this again in October where we sit down again and say, we would like to give the library $10,000 or you know, maybe it's eight, maybe it's 15, whatever it is, what do you guys need? And that way we can go back out to the community and say, here's where your dollars are going. You know, we bought these new tech toys or we bought this new, um, you know, section of books or whatever it is that you guys need. And so that helps us raise more money and it helps you guys get more stuff. What would it take to get What would it take as far as? Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, I, I think what I've asked is not so much the equipment number, but how do we library as the present foundation work together with the increase in amount of revenue and monies to be contributed to the library? Is this a program or some task or position or whatever we're allowed to have on this? I mean, I, I mean, I'd like to step up and work closer with you guys in the public and see how we can do, especially since you need some shortfall. I'm not sure about the reduction in revenues and support for inclusion. Yeah, so I think it's an important question. My opinion is that there should be a paid foundation director that could really work to bring that money in in smart ways because we've kind of tried some different things. This community is sometimes hard to read on where they're going to put their money. But I think if we had a foundation director that could work between our two boards, we could bring in more money. And whether that's through grant writing or um, letter writing campaigns or just sitting down for coffee with people, you know, important people in the community to ask for money, that, that's my opinion on how that would go. I think uh, the Friends and Foundation are very fortunate. They just got a new board member, uh, Carolyn Snyder. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn was a uh, fundraiser in her pre-retirement life. And yeah. so she has some really good ideas that I think if she sits down with us. But the biggest thing is that you have to have something that it's worth people giving money for. So operational funds are not something the foundations generally raise. They do capital campaigns. They fund special projects. It has to be something that someone can really uh, get behind and feel that they're making a significant contribution. And so operating costs are not that. Uh, if you think about the Weld RE4 School Foundation and the Flip Flop Gala, what they do with that money is provide grants to the teachers and the teachers write a grant to get something that they can't get out of operational funds that'll help their students in some way. And, and so they do the flip-flop gala, they raise all this money and then the teachers and then the students benefit from it. And so people will donate. But if you just say, oh, well, we want some money to pay the staff salary, usually people are like, yeah, that's what your taxpayer dollars are for. So you have to have a plan, you have to have something you know, capital campaigns are very often a big thing. I know Estes Valley collected money to put the addition on their library. Um, it's usually for a new building or a major renovation or something that people can assign their name to, um, that they can get a plaque or some stones in the ground or something that it's a tangible thing that they can get. Or it's a, a wonderful program that you didn't fund before. So tech toys were a, a, a glamorous thing that could be funded because when we were circulating and we are doing that again, people were in love with those tech toys. What do you mean you can check, check out a drone? We love drones. What do you mean we can take this little robot out? And so something like that where the Friends and Foundation get recognition for something that's unusual helps. So for every project, the present family is going to find that be with dollars on our side. That's right. 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 Yeah. It's it's so it, it has to it. yeah you have to yeah it has to look like something um, that people could get excited about and then that does free up other money. Has anyone tried to identify and mobilize these underground groups called book clubs? Mm -hmm. You know, could you do a battle of the book clubs and somehow these are people who are passionate about reading and get together and socialize and. There was a little um, chatter on social media in my neighborhood lately about um, little free libraries and how someone in the neighborhood uh, had to take one down because the HOA said no. And then somehow a neighboring neighborhood got five free little. So there was just some discussion and people saying, oh, I'm so happy to hear this. I love reading and I love my book club. And I thought these people are out there. And, and could we somehow identify neighborhood book clubs and could you ever bring in staff who could sit down with someone who's financially affluent in this community and have a very say, hey, we're trying to put a roof on the building or we're trying to buy a new automobile or we're trying to build a new building, try to check with five grand, 
you haven't been, or is that what you're that, suggesting? You um, well, so Carolyn would be our best bet on that because she's done that before. And um, Joanne and I could go with her. We had a foundation, a part-time foundation director named Sarah Walsh, and she was also willing to do that kind of thing. Because I, right now we only, we're down to five members on our foundation board and they're all volunteers just like you guys. But I think that expertise of sitting down with influential people takes a special skill set, And I don't see it except for in Carolyn right now. Um, but if you were to hire a professional who's done that as their job, um, that would be tremendously helpful. Yeah, if you look at the numbers last night, I don't know if you even hire somebody. Are you suggesting the library hire them? Or yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, with the, the foundation, you know, we could talk about the foundation contributing. Either way, it's the library paying for it in some way or another because the foundation it, it, it we're giving to the library so whatever we're spending on whatever wouldn't go to the library it's just thank you yeah uh, there was one more point i went oh so to ann's point about the plan that's where we really would like to get more involved with you guys about this story that we're going to have to put together for the community. So is the story that you're building a new patio? Is the story that you're doing a new teen area? Is the story the, the severance branch? Like whatever that story is, is going to be really important for when we go out. We need pictures and we need information about how much it costs and all of that. And what is the priority list really? And the priority list this would be a front facing priority list. Like maybe the Ash Street property is the highest on, you know, day to day. That's the most important for the library, but that's probably not the most important for the community. So we would have to put that at the end and find out what the front facing priorities would be. So we're looking for that list from you guys. And if we could get that sooner than later, that would be awesome. We've been very open to taking presentations about what the goals are for three priorities. But I think we need something more specific. So you said a uh, million dollar renovation for this building, but we don't know what that looks like. And, yeah. and we won't for a little while until we hire the architect and okay. start getting into the specifics of, so because the renovation that was a feasibility study. So the next step for both the Severance Branch and the Windsor Severance Library is the architectural port part of it. So once we have that complete, then we'll be able to definitely come back with a clear idea of what the scope of the project really will be, what the budget amount really will be, and you know, what the projects are within that that we could help coordinate with you on on in terms of fundraising. Okay, we're just a few months out for that. I mean, I mean actually, because it's not very, you know, library sexy. <laughs> right. Right. But you realize by doing Ashley, we free up all the space here for the library. So we do where everybody else. We have to put in the virtual space that's currently used for administration for the library. So, so that's a message we have to tackle. It but, is, but, I, but, but I it think... makes for a hard elevator speech. Like if I'm going door to door and I need a picture and I need you know something to grab someone quick, um, that kind of just reshuffle of space isn't. I don't think enough to grab money from people. Yeah. Focus on the rework of the space, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think when severance gets designed or somewhere, mm -hmm. there's probably opportunity for bricks on the ground. Um, I don't know what a brick would run, 250 a brick or something like that. Um, and then room naming, if you throw up a bunch of uh, meeting rooms, slap a name on the meeting room, and you want big donors behind the companies who are looking for to sponsor a room to put the TV on uh, and the basic decorations of that um, room. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe even put a wall plaque of their company in that room um, as, a, as a sponsor of that room. So yeah, that, those are all good that would give you a bigger, you know, bigger object for something with the company, the little advertising in the town and the brick maybe something for the walkway in or, or some patio space that 
you could probably sell to individuals that may want to put a, a chunk of money down. It has to be significant, at least enough to pay for the brick and the effort. And the, you, you don't want to be breaking even or coming up 10 bucks to pay that t-shirt. So you, you want something that's going to bring you there. And, and then if you do have an opening, uh, t-shirt sales, your, your basic knickknack sales, um, you know, I read at the Stephens Library or something like that, you know, where you can impact through that as you know, use the grand opening and other things to, to tie in. But that could be something, I don't know, two years down the road. I don't know when this library going to be built. Um, we don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and so I mean, I, I think the corporate sponsors are probably the things you could start as soon as we get some idea of if obviously if everything we use together, but you know, the individual bricks probably somewhere in the middle. <laughs> And then the you know the opening day celebration, um, kind of at the event. Um, that's a way I've been involved in the CSU community for far too long, and this is the way they suck the money out of me on a routine basis. Every time a building goes up, I get an invite. <laughs> they throw a little barbecue shindig, and you know, there's bricks on the ground, rooms named. <laughs> And uh, t-shirts shall be, you know, a knickknack strip that you can buy with the CSU logo on it. Right. Do you have a lot of bricks at CSU campus? Uh, we have a lot of bricks <laughs> all over CSU. I thought actually at some point it'd be a fun game. Uh, we don't use our name. We actually use a pseudo name for our bricks. But uh, it would be a fun to go find all the bricks we can throughout CSU. So I just pointed out that uh, that's where CSU runs their fundraising. Bang, bang, bang. And they, they do try to, you know, if you walk in the lots of CSU buildings, you'll see sponsored, every room sponsored by some company with their logo plaque on the door. And <laughs> you'll see maybe a little bit of advertisement in there of like, and we donated, you know, 50,000. I mean, if CSU gets the bigger, I mean, we're not going to get that kind of money, but, you know, maybe the local uh, insurance company may throw some reasonable money out of room name. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, $2,000 Yeah, um, it, it will be exciting to, to think of all these ideas and, and try them out. So I know um, it, it will be a challenge, I think. So I, I just know for our, our charter school, when we were building our high school, it was we had the brick idea and we thought this is going to be great and we sold 14 bricks and so it was really difficult and and that's a parent whose child is go, going to go there right so this community is um it's not you know they there's got to be it's going to be a lot of throwing against the wall and seeing what sticks so um but i think we can have the creative you know ideas come up and collaborate I did notice that you listed a lot of ginger events. Um, Severance also is ramping up. Uh, we haven't in the past, but uh, just uh, July 16th, we have concert in the park. Uh, oh, last okay. time we had, um, the June one had over 2,500 people at it, and they sold out everything. Wow. Um, I don't know what the opportunities are to you know, have libraries involved. In those types of events, but basically, Severance is basically hiring a band and uh, having local businesses. The chamber is usually the one driving a lot of that with the, the booths, but it would be interesting to also see the Sikh library can fit in as part of our chamber push. Yeah. So, and I think we plan on doing Severance days. Severance days is our traditional big day, but, but this opening season, there's mm -hmm. a lot of other little events. Not Seventh is starting to try now too. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, I wanted to talk about Clearview Reads a little bit, just so everyone understands how Clearview Reads works. Um, so in 2016, um, Kathy Murphy used to be a library director here, and she died, and her husband had 
an endowment of $100,000 that he wanted to give the foundation, but he wanted us to invest it through the community, the Well Community Foundation. So the Well Community Foundation stewards that money and every year we get a check or we can request funds from the dividends of that money. So some years we have used just a portion of that money and have been able to roll it over to the next year and spend a little bit more for an author the following year. We, let's see, we did, so we've received about $23,000 so far from them. And ticket sale for, we've brought in eight authors. So some years we've brought in more authors than just one. And we've sold 24,000, almost $25,000 in ticket sales. Next slide. Um, 2020 was a big year for us because we were really trying to go big. We had done some local authors and some, you know, peer review reads was really not a big event. It brought in maybe 200 people for Sandra Dallas, which was exciting because we sold out for Sandra Dallas and we were so excited. Um, but we really wanted to go big. And this book, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, had just been made into a Netflix movie. And Anne had an idea to contact William Camplamba's um, agent, and he was available. And so we jumped on it. We used the money from the Kathy Murphy fund, although we did have to supplement because he was over $15,000. So, but we thought that was worth it because we really needed, and this was right after kind of our last election year. We had, we really wanted a big event for the library. So, and it was, it was awesome. It was almost 800 people. You can go to the next slide. Um, the schools were involved. We held it at the high school in the auditorium, and then we had a big innovation fair in the, the commons area of the high school. So we had um, local businesses and lots of CSU clubs. Um, they were all, you know, STEM type clubs who came and had their, you know, their robots and their, you know, we had an algae club come. We had all kinds of things come, and it was really well attended. So. We only broke even, but we were really happy about that because with that big of an investment, we were kind of afraid we were gonna lose money on it, but we didn't. And it was, I mean, I still have people say to me, that was such a great event. It was so fun. Yeah, so it was a big plus for the library. And I think it really helped cement peer review reads in the minds of, of the community, like, oh, this is a cultural event that the library, you know, that I know the foundation does that, but a lot of the community thinks of it as one. Next slide. Next slide. This year, we, <laughs> we couldn't really bring anyone in because of the pandemic. And we just didn't have, you know, it was the pandemic, we didn't have a big planning amount of time. <laughs> right. But it happened to be Nancy Drew's um, 90th birthday. So we decided to lasso that and find a mystery writer, Ann Horman, who whose father wrote, I'm forgetting her dad's name now. Tony Hillerman. Tony Hillerman. Um, she agreed to do a Zoom presentation and she did it for free. We gave her an honorarium, but she did it for free. And we had some fun Nancy Drew activity for the community. And it was, you know, it wasn't as popular as the William Cam Kwamba event. We didn't have as many people, but it, our mystery dinner sold out and we did have, um, you know, quite a few people on the scavenger hunt. So it was, it was small, but successful. And then the people at the at the museum were excited about the scavenger hunt because it involved the history of downtown. Did you do it with your mm -hmm. daughter? Yeah, um, it was very architectural. Yeah, it was very architectural. Yeah. And people, I mean, there were people who, for the first time ever, saw the sign on the building that said the Windsor Hospital. And they're like, we had a hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just, so I mean, it woke people up to the idea of like, well, there's some history in this little town. 
and there's a mystery behind it. You know, where did all this come from? So it was, uh, we had a lot of really positive comments about the, the scavenger hunt too. I think one of the lessons we learned with Cam Colombo was that if you can reach the schools and the families, you're gonna have a more successful event or at least, you know, higher attendance numbers. So we went to the schools and we had a mystery writing contest for the older kids. And, um, you know, we advertised it really well at the schools, I feel like. So we did try to play into the family element um, and that was pretty successful and something we plan on doing for the next author talk too, is trying to find something that's family friendly. Next slide. Okay, so Friends of the Library is a relatively new addition, and I'm going to hand it over to Joanne, and she will tell you about that. Okay, so was it 2018? We started. Okay, um, so we realized that in order to recruit, if you want to use that word, more friends, we had to come up with sort of a plan of how you became a friend. And we took the whole theme of being friends and started um, a, well, on our website, I'm gonna pass these around. So a way that you can sign up to be a friend of the library. Um, and we got people signing up for the, for the emails and so they get regular information. Um, we don't have a lot of members like this. It's really not as easy to get people to do this. Like, Jenny said, you need something like for them to grab hold of. Um, but th these are membership levels that you can sign up for that it renews yearly. Um, they're not expensive. So we don't um, bring in a lot of money from this, but hopefully, you know, if we continue this and we have something to show them, like this is what is going to happen at this building, or this is what will happen in Severance. People hopefully will sign up. Um, so we use the whole idea of a pal, a buddy, a bestie. You have kin, you have a business partner, you have a soulmate, and it it lets some choices to people. And um, then you know the pandemic kind of got in the middle of that too. Like we were giving out, you know, coupons for the for the beer. Um, garden or beer tent and that well and that you know a lot of things have changed so this isn't probably very accurate but it gives you an idea of what we're doing but you can still <clears throat> sign up this is still active but if you'll take us to the um yeah, this is the um what you'll see where the friends and foundation library uh, uh, friends and foundation for clearview library uh, website and if you click on that banner where it says become a friend Okay, these are the, the choices and you can just click where it says purchase and then you, you sign up and you can connect it to your credit card and just pay that way. And you can really, you know, and once, you know, this whole pandemic thing is over, the one where, you know, you would get something for being a buddy, we'll have to reestablish some of that. And so this has changed slightly, but um, we, gotten a few friends from that, not a lot, uh, but it's very simple, so we encourage you to become our friend. So sign up in any way you want, and you know, nothing wrong with being a really good friend like a phone. Okay. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. So, um, oh, and here's one of the things we have in the picture. Looks like we're sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner. Um, this is one thing we had a chance to do before the pandemic, and it was um, a Thanksgiving dessert. You know, you have friends. Yeah, so you've heard of people doing Friendsgiving. You know, like my daughter and son-in-law out in California always do a Friendsgiving because they're out there in that San Francisco area and people come from all over. And not everybody wants to get on that plane of Thanksgiving like everybody else is, and so they have Friendsgiving. And so we thought we would do friends giving and show an appreciation for our friends. And it was a dessert event, maybe it's a turkey or mashed you know, potatoes or anything. Um, and actually, um, the, since the, we got the pie of the past summer, our, our cherry company was up um, 
where it's now said not the same thing, but um, they came to it was just a great time, and we all brought books. It was kind of like musical chairs, and you know, if you brought a book to, to give, you know, you went home with a different book. Music and books. It was a fun little event. Um, it was just, you know, hopefully we'll get to do it again. That was a lot of fun. And, people, and we talked, we did this impromptu book conference. Everybody just got to do it. was a lot of, you, know, you could tell it was my very time. And then last slide. So these are just our future goals that we've talked about. Um, we really want to increase that friends group, starting with you all, hopefully. So, um, but we would also like to re reach out to businesses. We have a business membership right. level and Brandon Pittman and um, uh, CPP, which is a wind engineering company. Their friends, or they were in 2020. So we have some more work to do, but we plan on reaching out to businesses. Um, we would like to increase our communication to our friends group. We're kind of waiting for a new member on the foundation to take over that role, just so we can send out more emails to them and tell them what we're doing and pass along the information that you guys have if you want us to. And then I think number one will be getting the plan from you guys for the next four years and deciding what we want to fundraise for and working together on that plan. We already talked about um, recruiting a foundation director. And then also we just are gonna plug away at establishing Clearview Reads as a recognizable and important cultural event for our district. So that's all we have for you guys. Oh, we have an annual report actually. And I, I passed it around. Yep. Oh, good. All right. Yeah, that shows very nicely what are what has happened in the past year. So are there any questions? Thank you, Jenny and Joanne for coming and talking about the Friends and Foundation. Yep, absolutely. You're welcome to stay if you want or you're welcome to leave. Well, let's move on to the director's report. Does anybody have any questions on the director's report? Um, as far as communication, uh, you'll be happy to know that our audit is done. Um, and so we have a draft. Ron and I have looked at it. We're going to actually be talking to our auditor um, tomorrow. And then at, we'll have to get our audit committee together and get some folks from our towns and school board and um, pick a date and then have them come in and review the audit with our auditor. And then we should be in good shape to file it with the state by the end of July. No extension will be required this year. So that's the communication that I have. And to talk to Morale a I did the mom thing. Don't disappoint me. <laughs> did anybody have any questions on the statistics? Okay, uh, the personnel report is actually included in the director's report to save Rochelle some time. So there are no additional changes other than what's reported. Uh, does it mention uh, Jason leaving? It Jim. mentions Hannah as a new hire and right. John leaving. Um, yeah, um, but that's one more, which I don't see in the director's report that he, um, 
uh, who, who did a lot of the pub trivia and whatnot was leaving. So there's kind of a bummer. Yes, Jason is, is leaving us. He's still with us uh, for a few more, for a week or so. Um, right. <laughs> Can't give Jason up that will game. stay on as the um, pub trivia MC until we are able to hire someone and get them trained for that. Because he's Super cool. pretty well known in that role. Is uh, is that continuing to be online or no, high hopes? Oh no, we have made the switch to awesome. in person at high hops. We tried the first one using the same um, platform that he was using when it was digital. So as to make it for like no contact, so we didn't have to go up and give them like a paper. That proved to have some difficulties. And so now we are just going to the paper um, submissions and we'll tally them up real quick. So it is kind of kind of back to old times. Cool. As far as pub trivia goes. I think when I saw that on, I believe it was Facebook or something, I clicked on it to find out, you know, can I go in person mm -hmm. and actually drink beer? And I couldn't, I don't. Maybe I was clicking on the wrong thing, but I couldn't tell whether it was in person or not. Okay, we'll take a look, and and if it's not clear, we can Maybe make just, sure that it is. It's it's definitely in person, it, and it you is, can yeah. drink beer or whiskey or whatever you want from yeah, the uh, distillery. Um, High Hops has changed some of their rules. Kids mm -hmm. are not allowed. Um, it's strictly adults in there now, unless you're actually purchasing plants. Um, so they've they've <laughs> they've gotten a little more strict with. <laughs> With with um, their rules for what it for coming into the um, the brewery. So. <laughs> when, when is trivia night? It's always on Thursdays. Um, every other week. Let me find out when the next one is. And we just got a contact over at. Oh, is it tonight? It's tonight. Yeah, it's I tonight. So. Just, I saw so just the next up. one would be two weeks from today. Um, like, you know, we also just recently, somebody put me in touch with um, the main marketing guy over at Peculiar Ales, and they are very eager to start programming with us or do something with us. I think they Ooh. have heard of our pub trivia program at High Hop, so we'll uh, see where that goes. All right, on to the treasures report. Treasures report. But can you push that up for everybody to look at? There you go. So, uh, just quickly, our cash position of 12,531 has changed a little bit. It's dropped by $35,000 and it's still record high. So, uh, as of today, we have $8.3 million in the bank. Uh, in terms of tax collection, we received 78%. Of the amount of money we post on property taxes, that still means there's a million dollars of money. And uh, even though, if you go down to the next report, which is the revenue and expenditures, you'll see we show 94% of our revenue budget total collected. But the reason uh, that's a little weird is because the other specific, the specific ownership tax is still due, but other revenue is like a 1,840% collected simply because in the past year from last year, we were unable to that data. So, so uh, we got a lot of money in so far. We're going to be running, hopefully, with a million bucks to get that in. Uh, so, if you look at expenses, expenses are great, except for county treasurers, we just put 97% of budget. And the reason we're 97% budget is because we received a lot of money from tax. That's why the numbers so much higher. And even with that being that high, we're 32 percent in expenses and budget used against the 41.6 percent. We're running for cash accounting, right? Say again. We're, we're running cash accounting, right? We're, no, we're running. Yeah. There's some cash accounting. But I call it. I call it tools. It's like a cash accounting component. Mm -hmm. Matt and I are talking to the auditor of the you know, full disclosure, I think when I took the job, I always worked in the cash account. Mm -hmm. In the school account, there's some uh, interest in it. And if you look at our balance sheet, you will see that we do approve for tax revenue for the year. It's part of our asset. So instead of waiting until we get the check, we're showing you it's part of our asset. 
So, uh, yeah, we do need to increase the production. So, basically, that's it. I think we still good shape. I think we have a cash flow. Yeah, you know, it says so $3 million. It shows here in our, uh, our, our um, building fund, it's $2.9 million, actually. And we're going to track this in the new. Any other questions? Well, that's it. Um, I, the number. I, in the absence of Kendra and Ron Clark, um, board alternate Frank Basler is a voting member. Um, so would anybody like to make a motion to approve of uh, Ron Dunworth's treasurer report? I move to accept the treasurer's report. Can I second that? Yeah. I think I just did. Um, any further discussion regarding the treasurer's report? All in favor of approving the treasurer's report? Aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, motion passes and we'll move on to personnel report. Oh, we already did that. Um, Friends and Foundation report. I think that's kind of already done too. Just a couple little things I was gonna mention from last time's Friends and Foundation meeting on the 16th was that Katie presented the facilities plan to the Friends and Foundation. So they have just kind of the broad idea of what's going on. And they know that, that we're trying to give them more specifics as we learn them. Um, they're planning a July working session. And one of the focuses of that is trying to find ways to build the troops, to involve more people in the, um, the Friends group. Um, recognizing they got a little competition this year, fundraising wise with what the school board's got going on. Uh, so that's the Friends and Foundation report. Uh, reports of liaisons. Uh, Lance, would you like to uh, go first with uh, the school board report? Please. Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we had a school board meeting here just uh, Monday. Uh, the biggest thing, well, there's two different things. The biggest thing that we've been working on uh, re uh, recently is just uh, approving our budget for next year. Uh, we pretty well got that finalized. Um, at the last meeting, we were doing a lot of teacher negotiations as far as salaries. Um, and, you know, we're happy to report that uh, we did a, um, a, a salary freeze last year just due to COVID. So we were able to make that up this year and also uh, uh, offer some, uh, uh, some raises for those teachers. So we're trying to get where we're a little more competitive uh, with uh, the surrounding districts uh, in our area. The biggest thing at the last meeting, uh, we had a lot of parents there. Um, everybody's concerned about masks and vaccines and uh, uh, what's gonna happen next year. Uh, as far as that protocol, we haven't uh, made a decision as far as, as where we're gonna be, but we're hoping to have that within um, if not this, if not next week, it's going to be the first week in July. Uh, right now, it's looking like that uh, we're going to uh, relax a lot of those protocols. So we're not going to require masks. We're not going to be, um, you know, there's going to be some different quarantine situations. But we're trying to kind of figure out what is what's going to happen to us if we we do this, as far as from. Uh, uh, the state and the health department. Uh, Dan has been on vacation for the last couple of weeks. I believe he gets back tomorrow. Uh, so we're going to hash that out and get that done. So uh, we got a lot of concerned parents, a lot of people who are upset. Uh, and I understand. I mean, I've got kids in school too. And a lot of you um, have got kids or grandkids are in, in school as well. So we're trying to just get that finalized uh, and, and just move forward. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can get back to some some type of normalcy or normalcy, you know, uh, that we were uh, before pre-COVID. So basically that's what the school board uh, has been doing. We have a uh, uh, retreat uh, the end of July where we're gonna go to Breckenridge and we're gonna kind of do some strategic planning and uh, get a lot of that stuff hammered out for this year. Uh, so just, you know, we're busy as always. And then also, you know, trying to get uh, things going as far as the bond that's gonna be coming out in November. Uh, we haven't done any Finalization on that. There's still a lot of uh, oh, a lot of questions that we need to kind of clear up as far as uh, what we're going to do with the Windsor Middle School. Uh, so we're hopefully going to get that uh, taken care of here in the next few weeks, and 
and move forward with that as well. So, is there any questions? Okay. No, oh, thanks. Um, Frank, I guess you're the other liaison. So, what's happening with Severance? Um, not much. Find more water, as always. Uh, it's a Colorado thing. Um, I think we have this year, uh, we're pretty much having an event every month. Um, just as an example, we, we did just have another uh, concert in the park in June, which I just mentioned it was very successful. Our next one is in July 16th. We have a nationwide night out in August. We have Seventh Day in August. We have bike uh, and walk to school day, um, trick or treat, uh, turkey drive Christmas. So one event a month for the town now where um, we are hiring for a, I hate to call the term party planner, but uh, basically, <laughs> I love the laugh, uh, basically community events uh, coordinator, I think is the more official title, but that's uh, the town party planner uh, and uh, social engagement uh, <laughs> individual. Uh, we're, we're basically using our parks more, our uh, community park has a bridge across it. We're uh, completing some trails. And I think with our community park finishing off, uh, we're gonna get two baseball diamonds there. Um, so we're expanding to, to really try to add some, um, moving away from, I guess, the small uh, little town to starting to try to find some entertainment for, for the townspeople. Um, so we're working toward that. Um, and as I said, we're still buying water. And it's like, I think we, what do we go, $4 million last time to buy more water for the town. So you do, you approve the purchase of $4 million worth of water? Yes. Yes. Uh, pretty darn close. It, uh, water prices are very high. And, um, what was it, 60 units? Um, I think a unit is an acre foot, but you don't get that. You only get 8% of that because of Colorado, Colorado water law, it depends which ditch you get it out of, and yada, yada, yada. Is it potable water? Does it have to be gray water, depending on the law? But we, we don't put the potable water. Um, so, yeah. Where do you buy from? Uh, so basically, it's uh, basically a farmer may be selling, um, selling their water rights. And uh, it, it's got to be out of various ditches that we can get to our town. Because uh, you have, actually have to get it to a processing plant, um, an our processing plant. <laughs> um, and, and so it, it just falls down to just people who have water down those uh, uh, water rights. And that, uh, I guess, water district. We're basically buying the perpetuity, or is it like two years worth of water? No, we're buying the perpetuity. So we buy four million dollars. So yes. That amount of water. Probably. Yes, yes. We have to. Yeah. So we're buying the right to that water. And as I said, it's it, hmm? He doesn't use it in the farm. A lot of farmers are. Uh, the the water is more valuable than their land and more valuable than they can sell crops for. So they separate the water, dump the water, dump the oil rights to the land, and you dump the land is dry. Um, let's be honest, people are worth a lot more than corn. As you could well imagine, the, uh, the price tag we're paying for this water. Um, so basically, this will allow the town to be um, slightly ahead of all the citizens we have in our predicted uh, engineering worst drought year. So the town will not go dry. No, no, calculate, there's engineering behind spending this kind of money. <laughs> this is not us just flipping coins. So we worked, looked out at what a drought year would be and making sure the town had, had the water. And on off years, when we get extra water, we do sell the, that, the water for the year, not our rights to it, but our, the excess water off to farmers and whatnot. So, thank you. Uh, I think that's it for our liaison. So, uh, reports of board members. Um, Ron, you have anything to say since the last meeting? No, uh, you know, Kevin and I 
not the preliminary audit report, but the cataract inspection and then dropping out of the inside of the country. So you can uh, approve it, but you can finalize it and maybe can move to the board as well as to the community representatives. Uh, Brian, anything here to the ground? Nothing new for me. Okay. Uh, Frank, anything outside of your liaison report? No. <laughs> and I can't really think of anything more that I haven't shared. So uh, I guess we'll move on to old business and approval of the minutes from the May meeting. Anybody see anything they need to make any adjustments to? Anyone like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the May meeting? A motion to approve the meeting from the May meeting. I'll second. Uh, any further discussion regarding the minutes from the May meeting? Uh, all in favor of approving the May minutes? Aye. 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 All opposed? And motion passes, and we're on to new business item two. So, right back at you, Ron Dunworth, with review of library investments. Uh, our library investments haven't changed. In other words, we have a very conservative program that matters for us. Interesting. Like we made more money in terms of tax penalty on uh, late payments. Uh, late payments of $800,000 in pay and fines and penalties at this point. And on that, we made $88,000 because uh, we made, well, and, you know, the amount of money we get from our Colorado Western investors are minimal, but they're a very safe investment. Uh, it allows us to not have to worry about the market swings. Which Hopefully, uh, things will work out with the government and, and the market uh, some time. I don't think we're anticipating changes on the investment strategy, so we can see that. I think we're looking to keep taking a lot of our cash to which we have now and invest it in uh, projects and programs that are the library district. So that's where we are. That's where we are on investment. Is there anything in the chat? Do you want me to repeat it? No, you're good. Yeah. Is there anything in the chat there that we need to uh, address? Awesome. Okay, so um, that's cldfriends.org, friends. cldfriends.org. What's that Did website again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, item three: remove fee for lost library funds. So this is the last, what I call a nuisance fee left. We reduced fines. Uh, we only charge fines on the newest items and on video games and interlibrary loan because it's not our stuff. Um, we took away the fines on children's books. We took away the fines on adults. Uh, we reduced our printing fines, but we still have this $1.50 when you lose the library card. Um, and it doesn't really bring in a whole lot of revenue and it's more of a nuisance to anybody who comes in and says, I can't find my card. And then you have to add the charge to their card because they don't have cash. It just has gotten to be more an, uh, a staff burden than it is a revenue generator. We pay nine cents a piece for the cards. And so our, my recommendation and the staff recommendation would be that we remove the $1.50. And when you lose the card, we'll just smile and say, here's a new one. And that would be our recommendation. Any questions? That just seems to make sense to me, considering what we've done in the last couple of years as far as you know, late fees or whatnot. So a bit of a no-brainer in my mind. We've been trying to make it easy and to stop you know, dinging people for small things and creating more work for staff than it's worth. Um, so, yeah. I was gonna say, if the cards costed more, I'd be more concerned, but if you're telling me the card is nine cents, <laughs> a free copy is 10 cents. 
Yeah. You know? yeah. Like, and we do up to two dollars a day on those. Like, it just doesn't seem um, like something we should continue to do. Well, would anybody like anybody like to make a motion to remove the fees for the lost library cards? I think I'd like to make a motion to increase. I'll second. Uh, any further discussion, Brian? Anything that's bothering you about uh, removing the fee for lost library cards? Nope, I'm good. All right, then uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And we don't have to worry about that anymore. Motion passes, and we move on to reviewing holiday closures for next year. So this, this is the proposed list. It pretty much follows um, what we've been doing for probably at least the last 10 years. Um, the only thing we may want to think about is at some point, and it doesn't have to be this evening, but we have traditionally stayed open on Martin Luther King Day, President's Day, now Juneteenth is a federal holiday, Columbus Day and Veterans Day. And we stayed open with the idea that the kids are off from school on those days and sometimes parents have nowhere to go with their kids or nothing to do. And so the library tries to stay open and offer um, programming or offer something. I think it's raining. Oh, it, I was gonna say something, it sounds like it's raining. Uh, so we may wanna think about that um, at some point. Do we wanna close? Do we wanna revisit that decision to stay open on those holidays? Um, but currently, I'm recommending that we stay open on those days. We usually try to do something like on Veterans Day, we try to have cookies and coffee for the veterans. We try to just celebrate the day in the library. Wow, that's really, I don't think we're being disrespectful by staying open. We're just providing opportunities, especially if, it's, like you say, the kids are out of school. So I don't think we look, you know, ball humbug for. You do work up to the staff. Uh, I, I'm sorry, what was that, Ron? You do have a reduced staff. Uh, on some of them, we have a reduced staff. On some of them, it's just like any any other day. You know, we're not slower because it's a holiday. Uh, in fact, sometimes we're a little busier because the kids are off. That's rain. Yeah, <laughs> it's rain. It's yeah, hard rain. So, you know, some of these days, like our staff have paid holidays. And in that case, um, if the library, for example, we are open on July 5th this year, but our full-time staff have that as a paid holiday. And so they'll be off on the 5th and we'll run the library with part-time staff July 5th, Monday. And the director usually pitches in um, and works that day and takes a different day off. It's no big deal to the director to work on July 5th. Uh, and so we, we do try to work that out. And if you do work a holiday, you take an, a, another day off. So are we taking action on just the approval of just the proposed holidays, not adding any holidays or subtracting any, unless you want to subtract some things. We are open. Um, 355 days a year. We close 10 days only. Uh, Are we see it cars in the have the curb <laughs> on the curb? No. On the south end of our parking lot, in the lot on that end, on occasion, yes. It did yes, not appear we were there yet. Anybody over there? It is a significant rain event, at least it sounds like it, and that it is. part of the parking lot tends to flood. Interesting. Where are you parking? I. Let's just wait a minute and while people check on their vehicles.
Grandpa? I wonder, um, I wonder what gardens look like. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. It's like I want water, but nothing um, good. Like all at once. Oh, it's uh, exhaling. Yeah. Well, um, Ron, should we uh, just continue and go ahead and take care of this item of new business? Sure. Anybody have any problems with the proposed holiday closings or is anybody uh, interested in making a motion to approve? I motion that we approve the holidays as I'll second. Any further discussion regarding the holiday closure calendar? All in favor of approving as uh, outlined by Ann? Aye. 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 All opposed? And motion passes. And next up, if anybody uh, would be so kind as to read our uh, proposal for entering executive session. Sure. An executive session pursuant to CRS 24.6.4.2 for the for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiation, develop a strategy for negotiation, and instruct the negotiator to respect the government and keep the government in agreement. I'll second the motion. Uh, all in favor of entering executive session? Aye. 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 All opposed? And at this point, uh, Will uh, have Bud work his magic? Sorry, I can't that not happen. <laughs> At 7.40, we're resuming the uh, regularly scheduled board meeting. We have with us Brian Lampy, Ron Dunworth, Rochelle Brodsky, Attorney Garcia, Bud Hunt, and Ann Klain. And does anybody have any other um, issues that we need to discuss? So for our upcoming agenda, you didn't even notice it. You didn't even ask. We didn't have any policies on there. Um, we were supposed to do the conduct in the library and the unattended children. Uh, Casey and I have kind of been distracted with other things and we didn't get to those. And so those will be on our agenda for the July meeting. And you also didn't notice that attorney Garcia and I dropped the ball on revisions to the bylaws. The bylaws yeah. So, I'm not bring it up. so, <laughs> so we will put those on the July and we will get that done for July. Uh, in addition, we usually look at population and housing stats for the district to see, you know, what's happened in the past year. So we might want to uh, take a look at numbers and see where we are now, uh, as opposed to a year ago. And then we do have the uh, procurement policy, which needs to be revised, and our alcohol and tobacco policy. Uh, also, the strategic plan quarterly update and the director's quarterly update for goals. So that's what we've got right now. And of course, they'll likely be in executive session. That's OK. Uh, that being said, anybody like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll make it a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor of adjourning the meeting at 742? Aye. 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 All Good luck, guys. Go get them in severance. They uh, want to go? <laughs> Play hardball. You want to go? No, I said you and Kendra. Well, you're welcome.